Uh, let me introduce our uh, keynote speaker here. Mike Powell, some of you may have heard him. Uh, he spoke at an annual conference several years ago. Uh, since that time, he has been featured on a segment of e E60 Sports. He was featured in a pretty lengthy article uh, in Sports Illustrated. Mike is a high school wrestling coach in suburban Chicago. His uh, school team has won two state championships. Uh, 10 of his wrestlers are individual state champions. And 31 of his wrestlers have been all state wrestlers. As you can tell, Mike is a very accomplished uh, wrestling coach. Uh, but that's not what he's here to talk about. Uh, you know, Mike was inducted into the USA Wrestling Hall of Fame uh, a few months ago. And so he's received a lot of recognition for his uh, res wrestling uh, accomplishments. But he's here to talk about uh, the disease that many of you are familiar with. Uh, most people, most of his students and his uh, graduates probably still think of Mike as the strong man, uh, as a wrestling coach who taught him how to wrestle. Uh, but life changed for Mike. And uh, you know, the message that you're going to hear is that no matter how strong you are, no matter how accomplished you are, this disease will bring you down a few notches. Uh, you literally need to pick yourself up and get on with life. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to ask Mike to come up and tell you his story and the lessons he's learned. Mike Powell. It's a great honor to be here, uh, to be asked to speak to obviously something that's, that's dear to my heart. Um, I don't spend much time uh, thinking about being sick these days. Uh, well, I try not to. Um, and uh, when Bob asked me, I, to be honest with you, I was really hesitant because uh, it was, it's kind of scary to me. Um, and it's brought a whole bunch of stuff back, but uh, it's been really, really healthy. And uh, I appreciate it, and it's a great honor to stand here before you guys. Um, nothing I'm going to say here is intended to sound preachy. I'm always scared. I've done a decent amount of public speaking, and my, my biggest insecurity about talking in front of a crowd is that people think I'm, I'm preaching at them. I don't have anything figured out, okay? I'm just a high school wrestling coach uh, who was a screwball kid at one point and, then, and was a decent wrestler and coach, and then, I got, and then I got polymyositis, okay? So please don't take that, that anything I say that way. I, I, you know, sometimes I can be pretty absolute when I say things, so. Um, two things, if anybody was in St. Louis, I, we can't remember what year it was. When last I, I spoke, they, Bob, the Sports Illustrated article had come out, Bob asked me to come speak. Um, and two things that you'll remember from there, and if you don't, you'll see here in a second. Um, one, I'm in no way a professional speaker, uh, so please lower <laughs> any expectations you might have. Um, and two, uh, in the next half an hour, I'm definitely going to cry. Okay, so um, macho men cry too. So um, I have nothing. I have nothing um, profound to say, you know, to you guys. I'm only here to remind you of uh, the great things in life. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my backstory, uh, and then I'm going to get right into some of these things that I've been really thinking about um, a ton. And, and you know, I already mentioned, um, you know, when Bob, when, when Bob asked me, you know, I was really kind of fearful about what emotions it might bring out planning a speech like this and having to come down here and, and, and talk about you know, my feelings. Um, but I also had some other things going on in my life. So I got really, really sick in 2009, and uh, um, really sick, 27,000 CPK. And I was falling down. And, I, and, and, and you know, if you watch the ESPN thing, and I hate that video, so if you're going to do anything, please read the Sports Illustrated article. I look like a much nicer person. <laughs> they find like the three times I'm screaming at kids and, and, and put it on the video like 40 times. I'm not that kind of coach. Um, but. I was a guy that, you know, I was super physical. 
and I really defined myself by my physicality. You know, I, I was I was a pretty pretty darn good wrestler, and uh, you know, I was the guy that was out doing more pull-ups than everybody. I was a rock climber and a bat. You know, I took my kids backpacking every summer into the remote areas of uh, you know all over the states, and um, you know, I, you know. My first two years of teaching, I didn't know. You know, I lived 10, 10 miles from school, and I rode my bike to school every day. Um, and you were um, okay back. Um, you know, they, I was proud of, of. You know, I worked out every day, a lot of times twice a day, and I was proud of the energy I had in that. And it was stripped from me. And uh, I went through some real hard times. I've made a good rebound, and I'm doing pretty well. You know, I have active disease, but uh, you know, it's um, it's it's ma manageable. So. At about 2011, when I became manageable, I started, I started really getting at my wife about having kids. And uh, you know, all I've ever really wanted to be, I mean, besides a wrestling coach, a teacher, is a father. And uh, so I started really, my, my wife, who I call Pinky, um, Elizabeth, she probably wouldn't be too happy if I, if I called her Pinky. I know I'm on camera. Sorry, Pink. Um, so. Uh, she, uh, you know, she said, you know, I need to know, I need to know that you're going to be okay, and I need to know that, you know, these certain things are going to happen, and I went out of my way. You know, I, I, I've, I've lived a very disciplined life and ate right and did everything. I stepped down uh, as a head wrestling coach in a program that had been, you know, second in the country the year before. Last year, I was a first-time assistant. We were the national champs. Um, first time ever for an Illinois, it was a pretty big deal for me. <laughs> so it was hard for me to give up my life's work. And I'm still a very, you know, I'm, I'm an integral part of the program, but I, I made a, some real sacrifices to prove to her that I'm ready to make our now son my number one priority. Um, and so she okayed it. And uh, so we started trying. And, and um, I was really doing well psychologically, and, and like I said, I'm doing well physically. And, but these these horrible horrible thoughts started coming to me, you know, as we're trying and, I, and I'm anticipating. Oh my gosh, she might actually get pregnant, and I might actually be a father someday. Um, and I think some of you guys can relate to some of this. But but this fear um, of being weak and looking weak, and. Uh, you know, not being able to be a father the way that my father was to me or that um, I would want to be for my son started creeping in. And I, you know, I never expressed anything to her, but for months I'd be up late at night, you know, thinking, you know, what if I don't make it to his high school graduation? You know, what if I, um, um, turns out it was a boy, so I'm going to use he, but he or she. Um, you know, what if I can't throw the ball with my kid? And what if I don't have the energy at night to be present with him and study with him? And, um, you know, it's really scary. And you have this horrible feeling, which I know a lot of people, IBM, Dermato, or Poly, whatever you, you may have, you know, you, you fight this kind of lonely feeling of worthlessness. And, um, you know, guilt. You know, I, I felt like, here, this, this is gonna be my responsibility, and what if I, you know, what if I can't do it? And uh, I had a friend and a mentor over one day, and we're sitting on my back porch. He was my first wrestling coach, and uh, he now is our freshman coach, so, so I've known this guy since I was five years old, 45 pounds, killer, 45 pound killer. Um, I saw, you know, I said to Fred, and for months I've been thinking about this, Fred, and uh, I got to run it past you. And, and I said it, I, and I had tears in my eyes, and I said, and I don't know if I could do it. And uh, Fred said to me, he's real deliberate, so of course he took like three minutes to answer, where I'm hanging on him, you know, and this, what this man says to me is important. He's smart and thoughtful, uh, and, he, and we love each other dearly. So he said, you know, that's, that's not the Mike Powell I know, you know. Who, at what point did your disease decide who you were going to be? And he said, you still have as much to give as anyone I know. You might have to give it in a different way, Mike, 
but you have a lot to give. And you have a lot to, to look forward to and blah, 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 blah. So at that moment, I realized I had been a complete wimp. And given in, to, and, I'm, and, and don't get me wrong, I know, I know a lot of people here have a lot of fears, and I'm using wrestling coaching terms, being a wimp. But I realized, you know, I had given in to this thing that, that I had really fought and thought I had mastered. And the truth is, you don't master it, it's always there. You have to actively beat it. And, and these psychological issues, I kind, of, I kind of allowed them to creep back in. And this self-doubt and the worthlessness, the, the, the horrible feelings of loneliness and, 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 and fear of what, what's coming ahead, um, you know, they kind of had overtaken me a little bit. And uh, when Fred said that to me, you know, I got, again, I'm an, I know this is not right because I'm tired all the time and I know you guys can relate, but I'm an insom I don't know how it's possible to be tired all the time and also be an insomniac, but I am. So <laughs> I do a lot of my thinking and I don't journal. <laughs> uh, Having a small bladder, I think, having to get up like three times in the middle of the night doesn't help. Because then I start thinking about horrible things. And, you know, I don't journal, but I do write down. I do journal. I just do it electronically on my phone. So I, I spend a lot of time writing notes down in my phone. And um, you know, that night I wrote to myself, you know, you had resolved years ago to not give in to this stuff. And it's time to step up um, and become the father that you want to be. And it might not, I, might, I might not be able to throw the ball with the kid, you know, but... Uh, there was a lot at that point to look forward to. And I wrote some things down. I wrote five things down. And I've been thinking about them a lot. And I, and I, and I made an, I, I absolved to keep these on the front all the time. And, and oops, excuse me. And, and, and again, this is nothing new. Um, just five things that I, that I think everybody should think about. Um, Illness, not illness, you know what I mean? These are things that people who live great lives, uh, who are happy and fulfilled, uh, do regularly. And um, you know, it's, it, my, the best times of my life since 2009, um, these have been present. And since that night with Fred, um, I have worked hard. Uh, and I now have a seven and a half month old son. It's funny. So. From 2009, you know, I cried for like six months. And then it became hard. I couldn't cry at all. Um, and then when I just, we decided we were, this is an aside, that when we decided we were going to have a kid, all of a sudden I could cry again. Then I had, we had a son. And for 60 days in a row, minimum, I cried every single day. <laughs> and I cried minimum three days a week. So I can't mention them without crying. I mean, I mention them to my wrestlers, and I cry in front of them. So. Sorry if I have to stop a bunch. But um, yeah, five things I want to constantly keep it on my conscience. And they're all choices. And I want to use that word um, a couple, several times in the next couple minutes. We choose how we feel up here. You know, There's not too many people in this room who get to choose how they feel physically. You know, and you can do your diet, and you can live a disciplined life, and you can do what the doctors tell you, and you know you can live regimented. But but in the end, um, the one thing we really know we have control over is our thoughts. Um, but it takes conscious everyday living, and it takes choice. Um, and you know you can choose to wallow in self pity, or you can choose to do some of these things. You know that I, that I'm talking about, and and I know. Uh, you know, it's ever present. Like I said, I thought I'd beat it. This is, <laughs> I fell for it twice. If I fall for it three times, I'm never coming up here again. All right? But, um, you know, if it's not conscious, it creeps in. So, first is, uh, you know, you, and I'll go through these and give some, some, some background and some thoughts that I've had about these. Um, but, but, you know, you, you choose to live courageously, first and foremost. Um, I choose a life of service and giving. I choose optimism over pessimism or realism. I'll get to that in a minute. I choose to invest and build and strengthen my relationships. 
Uh, and finally, I choose gratitude. And um, I'll start with choosing to live courageously. Um, you know, no matter what your circumstances, everybody has a right, everybody is capable, and everybody deserves to live a good life, you know, regardless of illness. And I think a lot of that comes from, from resolving to be courageous, courageous emotionally and to be courageous um, daily and taking on things and being present, you know, and being a person that, that people want to be around and, and a person that, that, is, that contributes in, in whatever way that may be. And um, so, you know, I think we have a right to, you know, illness or not an illness, to live a meaningful and fulfilling an impactful life. Now, I'm only 39 years young. Um, I'm gonna, I, plan to, I plan to see my, uh, my son walk across the stage at his high school graduation, which means I got a lot of life to live. And I think a lot of us do. And I, and I don't know what, what the, you know, I, don't, I can't speak to any individual here, but whatever that, whatever that finite number is, I know one thing, there's nobody in this room who doesn't want to you know, live a great however many top years that is. And I don't mean to be morbid, um, but I want to I wanna be able to say I, I did some great things despite, and maybe even just did some great things. Um, and I'm big on, you know, the, the Sports Illustrated thing and the ESPN thing was really nice, but I often felt like um, people, they want you to live courageously in your fight against disease. And, and I don't like that because I don't like to be defined as a person that's the guy who has a disease. I don't want to, you know, that's the wrestling coach that's sick. You know, and I, I want to be, that's the great guy. You know, that's the giving, caring man you know, who's going to hopefully raise a great son and, and is a great husband and a great friend and the best person he can be, who also happens to have a, a muscle weakening disease. And so I asked you to differentiate that a little bit. You know, the fight, of course you're fighting your disease courageously, but living courageously is something different. And choosing to wake up on a daily basis and maybe get out and do the things or take on some of the challenges. Again, whatever they may be for you, it takes courage. And uh, putting one, set, one foot in front of the other when times are difficult takes courage. You know, um, and so I, I encourage you to do that. Um, this, is a, this is a macho guy thing. <laughs> But I've had this quote memorized for a long, long time. And, and I put it in here because it meant something very different to me when I was 29 and healthy and I could do 60 pull-ups in a row. And I could sleep four hours a night, you know, 40 nights in a row and get up and do it you know, again and again. I had more energy than I know what to do with. Um, and some, a lot of you guys are probably, probably um, familiar with this, but I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read it just in case I, I choke in front of you guys. I'm gonna, I have it in front of me, but I can, I can probably do it from memory. Um, and a lot of you guys know it, but I want you to take an account, I'll talk a little bit afterwards, but I want you to, um, I think it's a great metaphor for challenging yourself. And for me, the critic right now is not what it was for Teddy Roosevelt, it was probably the media or his political opponents. This is called the man in the arena. And it starts talking about a, a, a critic. And uh, for me, the critic is me. And it's my demons. And my self-doubt as a result of disease. Um, it's not the critic that counts. It's not the man who points out where the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done things different. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again. 
because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually, who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best in the end knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So I, I originally memorized this, and I know some of you guys are thinking, asking yourself, why did I read this? But I originally memorized this so I could say it in front of my wrestlers, and it would sound awesome about getting in the arena and having your face marred with dust and you know, blood, sweat and blood, and you're a gladiator. And now, it reminds me to be courageous enough to have a son and do the very best I can do by him, to be in whatever, and my arenas are very different than they were before, as I'm sure most of you guys. It's a new definition of normal and everything else. But this, and this is a true story, I ordered a way overpriced framed copy of this for my son's room. And he's seven and a half months old, but I read it to him about twice a week. <laughs> I don't have to read it, I have it memorized. And I do it because it reminds me that my greatest arena now is fatherhood. And disease uh, and illness will never put me on the sidelines, ever. I'm going to be the, in the arena in whatever it is I choose to do. And I'm always going to step out in the arena. And I'm never going to be, I'm always going to be in some way, shape, or form, hopefully, a man who dares greatly. I never want to be a cold and timid soul. And I feel like disease and the loneliness that comes along with it can really push you into that hole. And it can really push you to the sidelines. And I want to encourage you to get out there and be courageous in whatever it is you're doing. I choose a life of service. And again, service, I, cho I chose the word service to remind me that there is great reward in giving and living for something bigger and greater than yourself. And I know different people serve in different ways. People serve their, their God, people serve the military, you know, you serve your family, you serve your employees or your employer. Uh, you serve your community, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking a little bit beyond that. And, um, you know, serve your relationships, and you serve this. And, and I think there's a level of self-absorption that naturally comes with illness. Everybody's always asking me how I'm feeling. It drives me nuts. You know, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can do that too. You know, I, you know. I'm doing great. I tell them I'm doing great when I'm doing great or not. So <laughs> stop asking. I'm, I'm always doing great. You know, I'm sure a lot of you guys are, are doing that. But you know, and it's almost like they want you to have this kind of narcissistic, you know, self-absorbed view of yourself as this sick person. And uh, I don't believe it's healthy. And so I put this idea of service down for me um, to remind me that I'll, the best life I can live is in the service of my loved ones. My son, my wife, my family, my father who's here, uh, my wrestlers, my community, and everything else. And uh, I've got a quick, couple of quick stories about that. So in Washington, Illinois, I don't know if any of you guys will remember this, was devastated by a hurricane a couple years ago. I called my Best friend in coaching, one of my very best friends in coaching. Guys, I don't know how it's possible that a hillbilly from Deer Creek, uh, he's actually from Deer Creek, I call it Deer Creek. Um, I'm an urban guy, he's a country guy, uh, just outside of Washington. Uh, I don't know how we could ever become such great friends, but he's like a brother to me. And uh, so our guys train together, I know all his guys, he knows all our guys, and, you know, we both run pretty um, good wrestling teams, and so this guy, Brian Medlin, I called him, and I couldn't get him on the phone, and I was freaking out. I'm watching the news, and the town was devastated, and I finally got a hold of him, and a bunch of his wrestlers um, 
houses had been wrecked, and his, and his wrestling coach, high school wrestling coach, his house had been just floored, devastated, while they were in their basements, and it was a pretty scary episode. So I, li I got off the phone, and I was like, man, if this was 10 years ago, I would get in my car, I would drive to Washington, I'd be down there for a week, and I'd be kicking butt with Medlin. But I can't. And I felt horrible about it. And the next day, I'm talking to one of the coaches, and I'm like, I'm helpless. I can't do it anymore, you know? And he said, well, Mike, you know, <laughs> I know you can't do it anymore. Why don't you organize the whole Husky wrestling family? Why don't we go down there and spend a day? So a couple of weeks, a week later, on a Saturday, we got up at 4.30 in the morning. We drove down, and we brought 115 people to clear uh, houses from the, you, it, I guess the disaster relief won't pick up your debris, and you, you're in charge of clearing your own possessions. So we went to these wrestlers' houses, and when I say we, I mean everybody else. I worked in the soup kitchen with the ladies, uh, preparing lunch. <laughs> um, but our, our young studs, and uh, a lot of their parents, and uh, brothers and sisters came down, and they, and they cleared a bunch of houses. And one of the dads said to me, you know, it would have taken me six weeks with my family to do this. And, and so crazy, but like, using my head, I ended up serving in a better manner than I would have had I been my old macho self and drive straight down there. So um, it was great to be able to serve in that manner. And that's kind of your traditional service, you know. Um, but but I, I get this other story that my sister shared with me not too long ago. My sister's uh, one, of the, one of the greatest people I've ever met. Uh, just, just a wonderful, wonderful, kind and giving person. And she told me this story, and it really touched me. One of her friends has ALS. And uh, it was, is, was, is not doing well. And uh, you know, it, it is, is nonverbal, doesn't have, is using a wheelchair at this point. And um, they threw a birthday party for her. And uh, you know, a dozen or so people came, and my sister showed up. And this woman, and, and literally, this was, this was for her, to let her know, her friends had organized this, to let her know how much she was loved and what a wonderful person she was. And my sister um, showed up, and she said, this, this woman had created a unique gift that related to each of their friendships, every single person there. And with computer-assisted technology, written each person a letter an individual letter stating how much they meant to her, how much their friendship meant to her, and how grateful she was to have them in her life. And uh, she told me that story, and I thought, now oh, that's a woman who has service on her mind. You know, she is in the very toughest, toughest time possible, um, is serving her loved ones and her friends in, in one of the most touching manners I've ever heard. And so I think service comes in a lot of different ways. And, 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 but I think if you keep it on your forehead, or, or, or on the front of your mind, um, you know, you can feel really good about yourself if you're out there in some manner um, making the world a little bit better place. So I'm doing my best to serve. And I hope you guys will consider the idea. Um, optimism. Again, this is not, I'm, not, I'm not telling anybody here anything you don't already know. Hopefully, I'm just reminding you. Um, I'm a naturally pessimistic person. And, and for a long time, I called myself a realist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. And now I'll tell you, realists are pessimists in sheep's clothing. So <laughs> when you don't feel good and your head hurts and your body aches and you're tired all the time, it is really, really easy to have a pessimistic view of the world. And you have to choose consciously. Sorry, Bob. I'll, I'll finish. I'll get through this as quickly as possible. You have to choose. I'm not going to tell this story. But you have to choose to live a, a life of optimism. Um, you know, that's within our control. 
Um, that's a good, that's a good, good ringtone. Um, pessimism, not courageous. Optimism, conscious, choice, courageous. And, and I'm cutting that short because I want to get to the rest of this before Bob cuts me off. How much, better is the, how much better is the world if you see it as a wonderful place, right? If you choose to see the goodness in the world, then it's all over. I've been in the depths of pessimism and the heights of optimism, and, and it's tough. Optimism's tough. But you've got to choose to love life and whatever cards you're dealt. You know, you've got to play them. You've got to play them with all your might. I know you're going to play them well. Um, continuing to build and, and strengthen relationships. This is similar to that service idea of friendship and family and everything. But, but I just want to, and I'll touch on this real quickly. One of the hardest things for me personally, and I don't know, I don't know if it's because I'm a macho, for, formerly macho male, um, or, or if this is what illness does to you, but for a long time, I had a hard, hard time expressing love for others and saying deep and meaningful things to my loved ones and to my friends and, and allowing myself to feel emotion, deep and meaningful emotion, other than sadness and, and desolation. And so that night I committed and I put in a lot of thought into this, a lot of conscious living into this since then, and it's been great. I have, I have put a lot of thought into making sure that I'm not going to fear opening those floodgates of emotion. You know, I turned it off. And it's just easier sometimes just to turn it off. So, because with the good, oftentimes comes the bad. Uh, but I resolved to be tough enough to be vulnerable and to never, ever, ever let my dear friends and, and wife and now my son, you know, I don't, I don't want him to ever, ever, ever wonder about how much his father loves him because I was scared of letting my emotions go a little bit. So that's that. And then the final thing is that, Bob, I'm, gonna, I'm hustling through. I got one minute. Gratitude. The world is a better place when you wake up in the morning and you say, I'm thankful to put two feet, two wheels, or whatever you're putting on the ground that day. The world is a better place. You know, and, it go, and a lot of these are connected, obviously, optimism and gratitude. You can't have gratitude without optimism. But I think we can all do our best to choose to not see what we're missing out and not see the way, you know, we, every, we, everybody knows our lives have changed forever. And there's things we can never get back, you know? That's my, my buddy says, and I think he quoted it from a movie, it's like a bag of bricks you carry around. Just set it down and walk away. You know, I choose to be grateful for, for the things I have in my life. We can choose every day to say, look at this. I look at these loved what you look at these people who love me. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful life I've led and will continue to lead. And, and, and um, when you're grateful for all those things that you have, and whatever opportunities may be, whatever opportunities are, are set forth in front of you, um, I think we can have, you know, we can live more, a better and a more enriched and, and fulfilling life. You know, and then the final thing, um, you know, yeah, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna play soccer with my kid. I might be able to kick a little bit of ball around, uh, so I'll teach him chess. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, you know, I'm not gonna wallow in that. I'm just gonna spend my energy where I can, and I'll. I'll find a coach who can teach him soccer. You know, I'll, I'll get a big brother from the, from the Boys and Girls Club or something. But, um, you know, 
if you, if you choose to love life and you choose optimism and, and you choose to, to be in the arena every day, whatever lies ahead is going to be awesome, you know? And it doesn't have to be bad, I don't think. I think it can be great. And, uh, you know, when I lay my head on the pillow for the final time, I want people to remember me um, or my son to remember me as a man of courage and optimism, a man who's grateful for every day, loves deeply, um, and is good. You know, I don't want to ever, ever be defined um, in the wrong way in, the, in that respect. So uh, that's all I have, Bob. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. So.